Well, do me a favor and track down a Bible if you can and get with me to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, we're continuing our series of Jesus is greater, and today we're talking about how great he is and specifically his greatness over our exhaustion. So this is called Rest for the Weary. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. And uh, while we're turning there and getting set and ready, and before we read it and pray, I was mindful of, um, well, I was reminded of what it was like when Harrison was a newborn all the way to year one. Harrison, our, our boy, um, our second born, we, li- we were renting from my brother-in-law in a house that had like a split floor plan for the, the, the master was on the lower level and then we had bedrooms upstairs and then, you know, we had kids and we're like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we moved into a loft area, which was a great idea, except for the fact that it doesn't have walls or a door. And um, Harrison was one of those kids that did not sleep. And so we would swaddle him up like a little string bean and we would feed him and burp him and change him and get him all set and ready and then we'd lay him down in his crib and he would sleep there for all of 20 minutes before waking up and screaming and Ash and I um you know both of us work and so we just we, we kind of thought we're we're looking after each other like we're taking turns but it basically meant that uh every night for months, this was the routine, 20 minutes of sleep and then 40 minutes of that process of getting him back into bed and, and uh, just another 20 minutes of sleep. And, and so we would joke, but it's half true. We would say, this kid is killing us slowly. And, you know, when, when Phil was talking last week about sleep deprivation and him Googling, can you die from this? I was like, I know what that feels like. Um, in fact, we look at pictures and you can see us age over those months. It's like we look like kids before that and then much, much older. Yeah, just wait, somebody says. Well, let me read Matthew eleven twenty-eight to, to 30. We'll pray and then we'll get to work. This is Jesus speaking. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now as we've opened your word that you, by your spirit, would speak over us. Help us to recognize who you are, this gentle and lowly God who loves us and cares for us and and tenderly ministers to us. So we pray, Lord, that you would grant us rest. Amen. 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 So why we need it, what it is, and how to get it. Why we need it, we need it because we're tired. It says here in verse 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. It's saying anyone who's experiencing this level of exhaustion, come to Jesus to, to find relief. We need it because we're tired. There's an ordinary tiredness, um, which is simply to say we, we work, and work is a good thing. It predates sin, something that God had Adam doing in the garden. Uh, he gave him a task. It gives him purpose. It gives him significance. It gives him something that actually is life-giving. But, but as a result of sin, ordinary work becomes frustrating, it becomes something that's hard on us. It's still good. There, there are glimpses of the goodness in it, but it becomes something that, that can sometimes be described as frustrating. It might be a toxic work environment. As you think about relationships and you're going to your place of employment and you're thinking, I do not like even going there. In fact, I have anxiety thinking about it. It might be a toxic work environment. It might be that the project itself is frustrating. That the work is good, but the experience of it is Uh, as the Bible describes it, futile. It's something that you do, but you do it and you recognize there are some things inherent in it that just don't work. Yesterday, I was mowing my lawn and it was one of those frustrating experiences. I I love mowing my lawn. In fact, I was talking to my mentor years and years ago and he said something that really stood out to me. 
I was asking him about how do you measure ministry? How do you know whether or not you're, you're successful in ministry? And he said, well, that's actually really, really hard to do. So here's what I do. I mow my lawn. Because then I can look at my lawn and I can see the work that I've done and the lines that I've made. And I can look at that and that actually gives me a level of satisfaction because ministry is hard to measure. So I mow my lawn and I, I have stolen that idea and I quote it all the time. I mow my lawn. I like doing things that I can see the progress and the work and the satisfaction from it then. Um, but yesterday was not one of those days. I have been using a lawnmower that my father-in-law gave to me, a hand-me-down lawnmower. It's probably 20 years old, and I've repaired it so many times that I was like, you know what, I need to get a new one. So I got one off of Facebook Marketplace. And I thought that was a great idea until I'm mowing, and the bag on it doesn't quite fit And so I'm mowing, and every, you know, six or seven times during uh, mowing the lawn, it'll fall off, and it'll hit me right in the shin, and I'll trip over it. So it's probably dangerous. Um, (laughs) But it just, yesterday just took me forever, and it was one of those moments where I was realizing, man, a good work, even a work that you could ordinarily enjoy, can be frustrating, and therefore wearisome. It can be something that actually makes you tired because you know, you, you like your job, whether it's, you know, a stay-at-home individual or, or a student or an employee. Like, you can love your job or a business owner. You can love it, but there are aspects to it that you just have to acknowledge can be frustrating and therefore tiring. So there's an or- ordinary tiredness, and I think Jesus is speaking into that here. But there's also a, a tiredness that comes from not paying attention to the way of the Lord. And that's kind of here in the context. If you look back to the earlier section in Matthew chapter 11, he's critiquing people and places because they're not attentive to what God is trying to do. He's saying if you only would open your eyes and pay attention, you would experience peace. But instead, you have rejected this way of God. I think some of us are tired because of this thing that we might not be comfortable with the language, or maybe not even familiar with it, but really it's idolatry. God has made us as worshipers. It's just part of who we are. And a lot of us are placing our worship in something other than God. We, we are trying to find meaning and significance and value in, I don't know, a promotion at work or a certain amount of money that we could make or a particular relationship that we've been pursuing. We, we worship these things that are not God, and by not paying attention to God, it's actually exhausting. It's burdensome. We're, we're, not, we're not doing what we were made to do. St. Augustine got it right when he, when he said this. He, it's a prayer. He's saying, you, God, have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We can be pursuing all kinds of different things in life, and we feel tired, and, and we can think, if, I could, if only I could get that, that would actually bring me great joy and satisfaction and rest and peace. And then you get it, and day one, it feels like that. But then you keep marching on, you realize, wow, this thing underperforms. This thing is not going to make me ultimately happy, permanently happy, perpetually happy. This thing is limited in what it can offer me. So we are tired because of idolatry. We're not finding our proper relationship to God. Another thing that I think is exhausting is what, I, what we might call religious exhaustion. And it's here in the text, it's in, in the context actually, where you begin to recognize that there's a way of talking about God and pursuing God that's actually unpeaceful. So if you just look at at chapter 12, you you recognize that Jesus begins to lock horns with the religious leaders, with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They're saying, your followers are doing things wrong, and they need to make some adjustments. And Jesus is trying to help them to recognize there's a way even in which you do religion and spirituality that can be burdensome. Later on, he'll critique the religious leaders in chapter 23, and I'll say, you're, you're placing a burden on your followers that you yourselves aren't even willing to lift a finger to help with. There's this way of Christianity that is burdensome. We, we think that we're pursuing the things of God, but actually we're, 
we're doing it all wrong. I was thinking about it uh, this week, and I was just recognizing that I think we, th- there has been a missed opportunity. When I think about 12 months ago, um, it was crazy because we were kind of on the front end of this wild experience that we've been through together, and there was what I would consider a spiritual openness. Like, I was having conversations with people who, in a normal year, would never talk to me about Christianity. But there was this openness, and so people were reflecting on life, and they were considering Christianity, and they were willing to talk about it. And then I was thinking through, okay, well, where are they now? Why, why aren't a bunch more people following Christ today? I mean, if there was this prime opportunity and this openness that, you know, I think happens any time that there's a catastrophe or um, any time that there's a disruption. I mean, even if an individual goes to a funeral, usually there's a, a recognition that, man, life is fleeting and brief, and I need to make sure my priorities are appropriate. And, and so that was all happening 12 months ago, and then not many of them made faith commitments. And so I was thinking, wh- what happened? You know, why, why didn't more people capture that moment and surrender their lives to Christ? And then I was thinking through, okay, well, how would that ever happen? What would be the steps that they would take to make that sort of faith commitment? Well, they would look at us. They would look at Christians. And you might, it's complicated, so I'm going to be careful here, because obviously you might say, well, we weren't really meeting, and so maybe they wanted to, and they couldn't figure out a way to do it. But honestly, I look at um, the first century, and I look at Christians in other places, and I think the, the restrictions on meetings is not a limiting factor for God. For us, I think it's just an evaluation that, honestly, we're probably just not good at adapting. Like, if, if the pandemic did anything, it showed us that churches don't really know how to be church without an event. And I think that's, a, that's tragic. But here's, here's where I landed as I was reflecting on this this week. I, I began to think through, people were spiritually open, and then they looked at Christians, and they came away with the conclusion, that's not much different. What I see in Christians isn't much different. It doesn't feel like gentle and lowly. When people observed us over the last year, and I'm talking about me personally, I'm talking about us as a campus, I'm talking about Christians in general, what I think is unfortunate is that they looked into Christianity and they weren't attracted by it. They found a people who were equally anxious, who were defensive, prescriptive, combative, and self-righteous. They, they looked in and they're like, okay, if my, my life is in shambles right now, I'm willing to explore spirituality, I want to know what that looks like, and they peer into our lives and they see, you know, how, how we interact and how we're processing everything, and I think it was disappointing. That it was like, well, that doesn't look any different. In fact, that looks very similar to the rest of the hostile world. I think we need to be a people who embody this way of Christianity that we're looking at here. This text is so beautiful. In fact, I've just been um, mesmerized by it this week. This invitation to the way of Jesus, it is so contrary to what, what we're used to. Jesus is different. He gives us rest. So we need it. We need it badly And I think that if we had it, it would be better for us. But let's talk now about what it is. What is this rest that he's offering to us? Look at verse 29. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, you will find rest for your souls. You will find something that will give you this inner peace with God. It's this beautiful invitation. It's kind of, I mean, as I think about the entire Bible storyline, I think the theme of rest is a major one. I I don't think that it's accidental that the Bible begins and ends in a garden. That you start out in a garden where there's this unhindered relationship with God, this walking with God in the cool of the day, and it's beautiful and it's peaceful, and there's no shame there. It's, It's just a very... A lovely place, and then chaos happens, and then the, the Bible storyline marches forward, but the end of the Bible tells us that there's this garden city, that the city of God comes down out of heaven, and it's this beautiful, 
very similar to the original one, but this renewed reality of life together with God. And this invitation then to rest is a major theme that's traveling through the entire Bible where God is saying, look, you are experiencing chaos and conflict and broken relationship with God, and God is doing something to restore that through Jesus Christ. The writer of the Hebrews makes that very plain. He says that there's this invitation to rest. And that's what God wants. He wants us to experience peace with him. And Jesus is saying, come to me and you will find rest for your soul. He is the restful one. He is the one who is himself full of rest. Um, There are a couple different places in the Bible where, where God tells us about himself. And that's significant because otherwise we're just kind of feeling, we're grasping at it and going, okay, I think this is what God is like as I, you know, interact with him in the scriptures. I believe this is what his character is like. But there are a couple different moments in scripture where God says, here's who I am. Let me tell you something about myself. This is what you can expect from me. And, and what do you suppose Jesus would say? God, God has said it in other places, but here Jesus gives us this very plain, very straightforward Here's what you can expect from me. Come to me, I am holy. Well, that's true, but that's not what it says. Come to me, I'm holy. I'm without sin. I'm perfect. And so you got to approach me with that recognition or come to me, I am a worker. I've got a mission. I'm on a task. You can join me in this work. Well, that's also true, but that's not what he says. Come to me, I am, you can fill it in with all kinds of different things, but here's what Jesus says. If you want to know what he's like, this is what he tells us. He says, come to me, I am gentle and lowly. I am gentle and humble in heart. This is the essence of who Jesus is. It's surprising because it's not how we ordinarily define him, but he tells us this is the, the foundation of what he is like. He is gentle and humble in heart. There's a, um, a new book that came out by Dane Ortland. It's called Gentle and Lowly. I actually have it up here. It's been one of my favorite reads as of late. And um, it's, it's this extended meta, uh, reflection on this metaphor. It's telling us a little bit about what Jesus is like. He's, he's gentle and lowly, and um, it's, it's actually such a good book. A lot of people that have read this have been profoundly moved by it, and so some generous individual said, I'm going to pay for a mass print edition of this book, and any church that wants it can sign up, and they can get cases of it for free. So I said, okay, we're getting 50 of them. And uh, if you're interested in it, I'm not sure when it will arrive, but I'd be happy to give it away to you. But there's this reality that Jesus is gentle and lowly, and that means that he is accessible and understanding. Let me read a couple passages from this book. It says, the point in saying that Jesus is lowly is that he's accessible. For all his resplendent glory and dazzling holiness, his supreme uniqueness and otherness, No one in human history has ever been more approachable than Jesus Christ. No prerequisites, no hoops to jump through. You don't need to unburden or collect yourself and then come to him. Your very burden is what qualifies you to come. There's something about Jesus that he is acknowledging here that just makes him relatable. It makes him, the way way I've been saying it for a few years now, and some of us don't like it, but I think, it's, I think it's a fair assessment. He's safe. Now, you know, safe is a, an interesting word, but he's the kind of person that you can come to and he deals with you perfectly. You don't have to be fearful of what that's going to be like. Now, I understand Lewis, you know, in Chronicles of Narnia, when they're asking about Aslan, the Christ character, and the question is, is he safe? And it's like, good grief. No, he's a lion. Okay, there is a reality that Jesus is a lion and he is, you know, terrifying in a sense that we should be fearful of him because of his holiness, because of how awesome he is. But at the same time, he's safe. He's safe in the sense that when you come to him, because he's gentle and lowly, he's going to deal with you perfectly. 
He's going to meet you where you are. He's going, he's going to be understanding. Now, he's not just going to be, you know, accepting of everything about you. you. You'll change as a result of being in his proximity. But you can come to him and he will receive you. He is gentle and humble in heart. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yoke is this, uh, it's like a device that you would place on farm animals, on oxen or horses, and and it would bind the two of them together. So they're side by side and they would then kind of work together. We have, we have draft horses here at the farm and um, you know, there's a device that you, you put the two horses side by side and they're, as a team then they can work in tandem and they can pull these horse-drawn wagons all through the, the fields of the farm. And I remember, and I'm not great at this, so Laura can correct me later or my mom can or somebody can, but um, I believe that one of the horses uh, passed away and so usually they're trained in a team. But what we did was we took this inexperienced horse that no longer had a partner, and we paired it up with a, with a mature, uh, you know, well-trained horse. And when the idea was, like, this is really going to help that horse to succeed. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying. You, you come to me, and my yoke, it's not this burdensome thing. You're going you're gonna to be wed together with me, and we're going to be doing this work. But to you, it's going to be light and easy. He, he's actually going, going to be doing the brunt of the work. You're just going to be keeping in step with him. So he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So yoke is a, it's a contraption that you kind of place yourself under, but it's also a metaphor that they would use back then to talk about this way of teaching. It's this way of teaching. So all the different teachers back then would have a yoke. They would have this way of life, and you could kind of say, you know, uh, if you're looking at different teachers, you can assess them and you can say, okay, this is what, this is what CORE is like. You know, we're a part of the McChesney Park campus and you come out to the tree farm and there's this yoke of Corey's teaching and it, it involves certain features of it. And, and you can describe it or you could look at another teacher and you could say, man, they're, they're a convicting teacher. I, lo- I love the way that they, they teach because every time I walk away feeling like beat up, but in a good way. So there are different yokes, and there there were different teachers back then, and Jesus is saying, come to me, because here's my way of life. It's easy. And now that's weird to say, because if you look at the disciples and what they went through, it was not easy. The things that that they sacrificed and the things that they endured, it was not an easy thing. But he's saying, look, you, if you wed yourself to my way of life, to my teaching, You will go through hardship and catastrophe and trial and difficulty. Some of you will even lose your your life, but you will experience the easiness of life with me. And that's a beautiful thing. Jesus is reminding us here that his way of life is beautiful. So D.A. Carson says what he's doing here is he's comparing the difference between the yoke of the religious teachers who are placing all these burdens on their followers and the yoke of Jesus himself. It's telling us then that Christ is showing us a better way to relate to God. It's not this burdensome rule-keeping, but it's a relationship with the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is inviting us to this way of rest. And you can't achieve this by rule-keeping. John Bunyan Um, the famous individual who was imprisoned and then wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he puts it like this. This is a little, little poem of his. He said, Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings, it bids us fly and gives us wings. You see, what, what the good news of the gospel does for us is it gives us what we need. It's this being wed together with Christ and being called to this radical way of life, but at the same time, it just feels like you're flying. Because by the grace of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are being given everything that you need to be able to walk in this beautiful way of life. So we need this rest, and Jesus offers it to us. So how do we get it? How do we get it? Well, we need to come to him. Look at verse 28. He says, come to me. Michael Green says, this is the essence of the good news. It's the invitation 
to go to the one who can give you what you can't get on your own. This is the good news of the gospel, that you are being invited into this experience of receiving from God what only he can offer you. It sounds familiar to Isaiah 55, where the prophet is telling us from the words of God, come and buy wine and milk and bread without cost. Come and receive everything that you need, and it will be given to you freely. And Jesus is saying, come to me, and I will give you this rest. Now, what's fascinating about that word is it's not just a command. It's not just like, hey, get over here. It's actually an exclamation. Uh, Therefore, it's kind of, they had to translate it this way, but it, it could have been translated like this. Hey, I'm over here. So he's not, he's not demanding like, hey, get over here right now. He's just saying, hey, hey guys, I'm over here. You're pursuing peace. You're looking for peace in all these other ways. You're looking for rest in all these other pursuits. But he's saying, look, guys, I'm, I'm right here. If you want rest, this is where it is. He's inviting us to experience him and he's telling us to come to where he is so you could experience it. It's a gospel invitation and what it, what it means then is that the, the people who are going to receive it are going to be the ones who recognize they need it. In fact, I just want you to glance over at verse 25 of Matthew 11 because it tells us something about the way that the economy of the kingdom of God works. The people who get it are the people who acknowledge their need. The people who miss it are the people who are too good for it. In fact, he says, praying to God the Father, he's blessing the Father because God has hidden this from the wise and learned and revealed it to the little children. What does that mean? He's saying, look, experts are going to miss out on this. People who think they know better will miss it. People who think that they're accomplished and deserving will actually forfeit what God is gifting to them. But little children, they'll just come and gladly receive. Little children are the people that he calls his disciples. He calls them little children over and over again. He's saying, look, you guys have been passed over by society. You guys have been passed over by religious leaders. You guys aren't the kind of cream of the crop for spiritual individuals. You're just kind of an ordinary group of people. But God has given you the insights to the kingdom. You have come to the one who can give rest. So when we think about the kind of church that we want to be, we're not going to be too big for our britches, right? We're not going to kind of puff up our chests and go, man, look at how awesome we are. No, we're just going to acknowledge we're kind of clueless. We don't really know what we're doing, but actually that's advantage because we believe that God blesses the humble in heart. He blesses those who are spiritually lowly. And so, we come to him and we receive from him. Verse 28, I will give you rest. He's telling us that it is a gift that he imparts. He is able to give us this rest that we need. So what do we need to do? Verse 29, it's not inactivity. It's not that we just sit around and twiddle our thumbs and do nothing and go, okay, God's giving me all this rest. No, it's this rest in this way of, of working, right? Jesus was a worker. He, he worked himself incredibly hard. When he, I can resonate with this because when, when he slept on the boat that was going through a storm, you got to be tired when everyone else is freaking out that they're going to drown and you're taking a nap. Like he just, he worked incredibly hard. He was spiritually exhausted, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, at different points in his ministry. But nonetheless, there's this way of rest. And he says, verse 29, here's here's what you need to do. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take, Take this way of life and wed yourself to me in it. Take this yoke and place it on you. Volunteer yourself to this way of the teaching of the rabbi, the way of Jesus. Apprentice your life to him. Follow his leadership. Work alongside of him. Keep in step with him and learn from him. This is um, becoming a dominant thought in my mind. And as I think about the future of our campus, I think this is going to be one of the 
kind of rallying cries that we'll have for the future. What we want to be about is learning from him. There's a way of Christianity or religion that I think kind of feels different from what he's talking about here. But what if we apprenticed ourselves to him? What if we determined that we were going to learn from him? That we were going to exhibit this new way of life? That we were going to be a new kind of church? A new kind of people who were gentle and lowly? Who were like him? Gentleness, it's it's a relational term. It's not just like timidity, it's not just like meekness, but gentle is something that you experience when you deal with somebody. I want to be the kind of pastor and I want to pastor the kind of church that feels gentle and lowly. Feels like a bunch of kids, childlike kids, living in this dependent faith on their good and gracious God. Let's learn from him to be this kind of people and this kind of church. So why do we need this rest? We're exhausted. What is it? It is rest for our souls. And how do we get it? We get it by going to him, the gentle and lowly one who will give us what we need. Let's pray. Lord, for all who have come this morning and are weary and heavy laden, Jesus, would you gift them with your beautiful rest. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not be spiritually arrogant, to not consider ourselves wise wise and learned, but instead we would acknowledge our need for you, our ongoing need for you, and acknowledge your ability to provide for us. Help us to take your yoke and to learn from you Help us to be gentle and lowly because you are gentle and lowly. Amen. Amen.